All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for the 12th edition of the Fireside Chat. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. For those of you who are new to the series, the Fireside Chat is a conversational webinar where we connect with some of the top professionals in the running health and medical communities. This week, we have Spencer Miller, who is an exercise physiologist and running coach in Bloomington, Indiana. Before we get started, let me cover a quick few, uh, cover a quick, a few quick housekeeping items first. Do me a favor and silence any technology around you. I have a lot of good inf information for you today, so I want to really make sure you get the most from that. Second, I highly recommend asking questions. Of course, there'll be specific items that we will cover as was outlined in the registration, but you are more than welcome to ask anything at any time to help positively impact your overall health and running. Feel free to drop a question in the chat box now or at any point throughout the chat if something comes to mind. Lastly, if you cannot stay for the entire chat for whatever reason, or you just want to reflect back on this content in a later time, I will be sending the replay of you replay of this to you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Make sure to check your email and especially the spam folder because it can sometimes end up in there. So without further ado, Spencer, thank you for joining us in the Fireside Chat. How's everything going this evening? Hey, good, good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, glad I to have you here. It. I know we, um, so for those of you out here that are watching, <laughs> I met Spencer, it might have been three years ago now. He was running the uh, the run camp group at Gazelle Sports in Birmingham and had a chance to work together for a short period of time. And um, I know he has, has kind of shifted here a little bit. And I think what really ties into the topic today, physiology, being an exercise physiologist and running coach has a lot of good information to share with us. So Spencer, if you can just briefly give us an overview of, of your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I want to start off with, start off with that. Thanks for having me on today. Um, and also I have a little bit of a head cold here. So if I sound a little muffled or have to cough here and there, uh, please forgive me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a former collegiate runner. I ran at DePaul University. It's a D3 um, university, um, which was a great balance of, of work and uh, learning. Um, so I graduated with my BA in kinesiology and then um, went to Eastern Michigan University to pursue a master's in science and exercise physiology. I was particularly focused on running uh, science while I was there. Um, they have a great program in, in terms of running science. Um, <clears throat> after, I traveled to Bloomington, Indiana, where I'm currently at, and uh, started working as a research analyst for the Department of Kinesiology. Um, there, we're collecting data on all sorts of um, physiological studies, um, from the autonomic sy nervous system to uh, biomechanic stuff um, and more running-focused stuff. Um, so I also have my own little, uh, small business called Miller Endurance, um, and it's a coaching business and, uh, we specialize in, um, particularly, uh, physiological, um, training zones. So we like to, uh, use lactate, um, as a marker of intensity. And so this is going to be heavily involved in this presentation today. Um, so we're focused on bringing the same sort of science that the, elite athletes have um, to the amateur athlete, um, help them improve their performance. So it's um, really focused training and that is uh, what Miller Endurance is all about. That's awesome, that sounds great. And so to get us started in the content then, if we start kind of chatting about the training adaptations with running, obviously different short-term and long-term things that can happen, but can you just walk us through some of the things, some of the adaptations we should see or maybe should aim for as runners just to see more success within the sport? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. We'll kind of today we'll start with the training adaptations um, and we're going to focus specifically on mitochondria um, and then we'll talk about why mitochondria are so important um, and how running at different intensities can um, develop more mitochondria and then we'll talk about how um, intensity is um, can be looked at through the lens of a training zone um, so in terms of training adaptations with running you have short-term adaptations um, immediately like two days post up to a week, two weeks post of consistently running, you're going to see changes in blood, through, blood flow through water retention. So you're going to start getting a, a release of vasopressin, which is a hormone that, um, I call anti P hormone. So you're <clears throat> going to re retain a lot of water and be able to, the heart is going to be able to pump out a lot more blood per beat. So this is going to heavily improve your, um, endurance capacity right away. Um, it's going to be cardiovascular changes. Um, long-term though, um, and chronic effects with, with training, consistent training is you're going to see greater capillary density around the muscle. 
Um, so you're going to be able to extract and deliver more oxygen um, to the uh, muscle. Um, and then you're going to see changes in your mitochondrial density and size. And we'll go over what a mit mitochondria is and why it's so important. But you're going to see big changes to the mitochondria. If you look on the, the right side of the screen here, you're going to see a cartoon depiction of it. It's kind of this weird looking organelle and it's, it's found in, in all of our muscle cells and in particular in our, in our muscle fibers, you can find it within and outside of the muscle fibers, um, which is super interesting. So, um, mitochondria are everywhere and they're really important to endurance capacity, um, <clears throat> and everyday living. If you didn't have mitochondria, then that'd be an issue. <clears throat> uh, next you see motor control efficiency. This is going to be over periods of years. Um, and it's primarily going to be from changes in the cells, but also, uh, basically like patterns of nervous system recruitment. So how you recruit your muscle, um, recruiting certain muscles, um, types that have really efficient cells or really lots of mitochondria. So, um, over long periods of time, um, with consistent running, you can see, um, big changes in your efficiency of muscle recruitment. Mm -hmm. So you said a couple of times, let me just ask you, uh, long periods of time and something yeah. I always try to preach. So to my clients, you need to be yeah. patient, you need to be consistent. So what are we looking at in terms of seeing, and seeing adaptations as a runner, if mm -hmm. you're following a consistent, consistent training plan, one years, three years, five years, like what does it take to us actually say like, wow, I'm in a better place now. Yeah. So if you just started running, if this is like your first time, uh, going for a jog and you do it for two weeks straight, you're going to see huge improvements and probably start to feel better about running. And those are because of that, those short-term improvements. Um, but in terms of capillary density and mitochondrial density and size, those things are going to change anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, every four to six weeks, you're going to get adaptations if you continue to train. So um, it is relatively short. You can see big improvements um, pretty quickly. Um, so that's why people train for four months and after four months, they are, you know, can be close to peak shape mm -hmm. um, if they do a training plan correctly and have the proper base. Um, but in terms of like running economy, which is motor control efficiency, um, it could take years. I mean, Paula Radcliffe, one of the world's uh, best marathoners um, in history, all of her data is published because she was trained by an exercise physiologist. And, um, over the like seven years, you could see her running economy improve a ton. So that means she's running at the same speed, but with a lot less energy needed to run at that speed. Mm -hmm. So she's becoming really efficient, but it, it, it was just consistent training over years. So, uh, naturally your body's just going to get more economical, uh, the more you because more consistent you are. So, um, it, consistency is key for mm -hmm. sure. I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's a good, good message there. <laughs> And so in terms of mitochondria, you mentioned this and, and it sounds like almost like a, a science fiction kind of term here. Like, what does this mean? How do yeah. these work and, and, and why do these matter? You kind of mentioned that a second ago, but if you can dig into that a little bit more and how it relates to running. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's start with mitochondria and what they produce. Um, so they're an organelle found in all of our cells. And there's not just one, there's plenty of them um, throughout every single cell. Um, <clears throat> They produce ATP, which is energy. Um, it's what we use to do work in the body. Mitochondria within the mitochondria, little organelle, a picture you saw on the previous side, there's lots of proteins in there that create ATP. Mitochondria are limited by rates of diffusion, meaning um, it, the proteins take fuel in order to create energy, essentially. And if, if there's like a factory and there's too, too much, too many boxes on the line, there's not enough people to take the boxes off the line, um, it gets backed up. So it's limited by rates of diffusion. So when they're full, less sustainable ways of ATP creation happen um, elsewhere in the muscle fiber. And um, these can lead to byproducts that usually impair muscle function and lead to fatigue. So mitochondria are huge for, they create most of the energy we need to do to run essentially to live. Um, and, uh, if they get backed up, they're going to help or they're going to, things are going to happen down a chain of events that lead to muscle fatigue. Mm -hmm. So, um, having lots of mitochondria makes you a lot more of an endurance uh, performer. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to talk about like how that happens. I have a little analogy here for you just to help you understand. So 
Um, this is my attempt at a, a schematic here. So bear with me. We have a circle which represents the cell. So the left side of the screen is um, gonna be the cell before adaptations and the right side of the screen is gonna be the cell after adaptations. So on the left side here, you have um, the cell represented by the circle. The bucket is the mitochondria. So the bucket has a certain capacity, right? Um, and then the square is the workload demand. So when you start running at a certain intensity, your body needs an, a certain amount of ATP or energy to be able to uh, sustain that energy, sustain that bout of exercise. So um, that square is represented as the workload demand, what pace we started running at and um, the ATP that you need to maintain that pace. Um, so let's say before training, you try to run at a fast pace, you have a high workload demand. As you can see, it, it actually doesn't fit in the bucket here. So it's kind of overflowing. That overflow is a great representation of fatigue here. So when you can't handle the workload demand, um, your mitochondria gets backed up. And that's going to lead to things down the downstream that are going to lead to fatigue. Um, however, if you have more mitochondria represented on the right side of the screen, so you can see here there's two buckets or two mitochondria relative to the cell, that same workload demand can be split into two. So the mitochondria is able to, the cell is able to handle the workload that you um, want to ma maintain. So um, mitochondria are huge for endurance performance because before the adaptation, you couldn't handle that workload. There was overflow and which led to fatigue. But um, after adaptation, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, you have another mitochondria, which increases the capacity of the cell to do work. Um, so mitochondria are huge for um, endurance, um, letting you maintain a certain pace. That's awesome. Yeah, good to see this too. That made that made a, a lot of sense seeing the, the picture there. And so generally, does everyone adapt, I guess is my question. Like uh, people probably adapt better if they're following a structured program that's specific mm -hmm. to them. But if you just run over a period of time, will you automatically go from one mitochondria to two mitochondria plus? Is that just what training will do in general? Yeah. So um, especially if you progressively um, intensify your training, you're going to see adaptations. Um, where you see those adaptations are dependent on the intensity you run at. So there's uh, for the sake of this presentation, two types of muscle fibers. And when we say type, we just mean um, what the, uh, the composition of the muscle, essentially, like what's inside the muscle cell, um, usually defined by mitochondria. Um, type one, they are um, going to be primarily recruited first during exercise. So if you run at a really low intensity, you're going to recruit mainly type one muscle fibers. Um, if you were just to run it at a low intensity over a long period of time, you would see adaptations in type one muscle fibers and probably increase mitochondrial density or size. Um, so, but that's only going to get you so far. Let's say you want to improve at a faster pace. You want to run a 5k, which takes a pretty intense pace. You need to train at or incorporate higher intensity training um, because that's going to recruit type two muscle fibers. And um, again, contractile activity leads to more mitochondrial development. So if you were to uh, run at a faster pace, you're going to recruit type two muscle fibers, and that's going to lead to a higher number of muscle um, mitochondria or um, a bigger size mitochondria. So you're going to increase your capacity based on the intensity that you run at. So it is dependent on what kind of race you want to do. If you're doing a last man standing race and a long trail race, you're probably just going to want to uh, train at a low intensity for a long period of time um, and maybe incorporate some higher intensity stuff just to become a better athlete overall. Um, but if you're a 5k runner, you're going to probably run at a faster pace pretty often. So specificity dictates this is what is your goal. And then your training program almost has to work backwards from the goal based on like the race or what you're trying to get to. Correct. Yep. That's mm -hmm. that's Specific awesome. Specificity and uh, progressive overload are huge mm -hmm. principles of exercise science. And I know you, we practice it in strength and conditioning as well. Um, it is um, really important for injury prevention and for adaptation. Right. For the staples really. Yep. So from a, a training zone standpoint, uh, everyone's, I guess, curious of, what does this mean? Uh, we're talking about different uh, muscle fiber types, slow training, more intense training. Um, how do you, 
how do you best train in different zones? What are those zones and, and what matters? Yeah, so zones are oftentimes, they're sometimes arbitrary. There's different ways of defining training zones and we'll go over that later. Um, <clears throat> so, the, but they're really important for, I think, two reasons. The first is measuring your intensity, being able to say, um, quantify how intense your run was. That's what a training zone is really effective for. Um, there's also data showing that if you run, if you basically jump your intensity too fast and you do a lot of training, really hard training randomly without any preparation, um, stimulus is going to be too much to handle and you could cause some, some damage um, and what we know is injury. So, um, excuse me, <clears throat> got a drink of water here. So training zones are really important for injury prevention and then also measuring the intensity of your run. Um, like I said, it's possible to stimulate mitochondria at higher intensities, uh, for short durations or running at lower intensities for longer durations. Um, so being able to properly incorporate different intensities in your training plan, uh, plan is really important. Mm -hmm. And so do we, we talk about injuries, uh, not training properly resulting in injury. Is there any type of, in, is there anything internally that we see from poor training or not training correctly? Is there damage to mitochondria where there's something going on in the body if we train improperly, or is it more so injury is the result that we're, we're trying to stay away from? Yeah, it's, um, it's more so injury. You can, um, if you train too intense, um, get very fatigued, um, overall in the body. So it might not just be like a, a muscular injury that prevents you from moving properly. It could just be, um, you become really fatigued, um, cause your body's overworked and um, you aren't able to catch up on your, your adaptations here. So, um, overtraining is a real issue, um, that can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, um, and, um, general fatigue here. Mm -hmm. Um, but also you could potentially get muscle injury, tendon injury, um, with overuse training, uh, or, or basically jumping too fast in intensity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in terms of training zones, then what is this showing us here? Kind of this graph and, and I guess, how does this. Does this differ to some of the, you mentioned a second ago, different types of zones, heart rate, lactate, ventilation, perception, mm -hmm. which I see commonly used. What yeah. is this one and what is it telling us? Yeah. So this is um, what we use at Miller Endurance here. Um, we use uh, lactate to demarcate training zones. Lactate is basically, we talked about that uh, mitochondria being full or backed up earlier. When your mitochondria is full or backed up, um, lactate is going to start being produced and lactate is actually a good guy. Lactate is actually helping, uh, buffer some of the bad stuff in the cell that is going to lead to fatigue. So lactate is a good guy, but it is a, a marker of like, Hey, this is a really intense bout. My mitochondria aren't really handling this too well. So, um, when you basically do a, uh, a incremental test of any sort. So I started a tread, I started running on a treadmill, like at a really relaxed pace. And then every two minutes, three minutes, I increase that pace just by a little bit. Um, and I do that until I fatigue. You're also going to see this sort of graph right here. So what you see on the bottom is your percent of your max speed or power. And then this little squiggly line here is the step test. So that's just saying every two, three minutes, they increase their intensity or pace. Um, and what you see is lactate on the left side here in the y-axis, it's going to maintain that baseline around resting around 1.5 um, millimoles per liter. That's kind of a resting value. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see two big jumps um, throughout that step test. Um, we define those as lactate thresholds. Um, and it's a very, um, I think, good marker of um, how hard you're working. And so this is what we use at Miller Endurance. It's a really commonly used test in elite athletes. Um, you can find this test on at many PT clinics, hospitals. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great um, example of how zones can be demarcated here. So you have zone one, that's a recovery zone. You have zone two, which is a more moderate intensity. And you have zone three, which is going to be more maximal. I think interval training. Um, so zone two is typically like a tempo run. It's a consistently hard, but not over, uh, intense bout of exercise. And zone one is more focused on recovery, um, and relaxed, relaxed run, relaxed running. So, 
So um, <clears throat> lactic, lactate, and I hear everyone saying lactic acid. So and, and I think probably something that's misunderstood and just thrown out there in a general way. Are those two things the same thing or are those different? And how would you describe those? Yeah, uh, they're completely different. Um, so biochemically in the body, lactic acid doesn't exist. It's just lactate. Um, the pH of blood itself, it, it won't, lactic acid, it won't happen essentially in the blood. Um, it's just basically defined as if it has a hydrogen ion attached or not. Um, lactic acid um, without the hydrogen, lactate without the hydrogen ion would be lactic acid. Um, lactate with the hydrogen ion would be lactate. Um, and so it's a salt versus um, an acid or could be wrong there, but basically there's um, a small difference and it's dictated on the pH of the actual blood is going to um, keep it as lactate. Um, if it were to be in a different environment, um, it could potentially turn into lactic acid essentially, but um, lactate is, is different than lactic acid. Okay. Yeah. I hear that thrown out a lot. You don't hear mm -hmm. lactate from people, you know, probably in the science world. So I was curious yeah. about the difference there. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of different zones, and obviously technology now is huge in, in, in allowing people to kind of tap into this world a little bit more in terms of heart rate ranges, breathing, all this type of stuff. Um, what are the different ways you can also track outside of the lactate threshold? Yeah, so lactate, it's, a, it's definitely the con of it is it's this little device here that um, you have to prick your finger and take a little bit, a small amount of blood um, every two, three minutes. Um, and so it is a little bit more invasive, uncomfortable, um, but there are other ways um, if you don't have access to a lactate monitor to measure um, your zones. Heart rate is a, a great way to do so. Um, to me, heart rate is simple to do. Most people have access to um, some sort of wearable technology that will measure heart rate, um, or you could take heart rate manually by palp palpating um, several different parts of your body. Um, <clears throat> so these are lots of different ways to define zones based on heart rate. Um, ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, it's a really well-known organization um, in the literature. So it's a trustworthy organization. And this is um, the recommendations they give in terms of splitting up their um, heart rate zones. So you can see like 96, that's represented as 96% of your heart rate max. To find your heart rate max, um, really simple way to do so or to estimate it is 220 minus your age. Um, it's been thrown around if it's that's a valid way to do so or not, um, but the CDC still recommends 220 uh, minus your age. And I think it's just a really simple way of, of trying to estimate your heart rate max. Um, so once you do that, so for me, I'm, I'm 25 here. So my heart rate max would be 195. I would then say, let's say I wanna work at a vigorous um, intensity. I would do 77% here. Um, so 0.77 times my heart rate max, and that would find a, um, a heart rate that's in that vigorous zone. Um, so you can define your, um, what zone you're working in by heart rate. Heart rate can be influenced by environment, sleep, what you ate, um, lots of different factors. So it's, um, a good way of measuring intensity, but not necessarily a reliable way of measuring intensity. It can be different from day to day, essentially, but it is a good way to gauge if you're going off a run. And your coach says, hey, we're going to work at a higher intensity today. Um, I want you to be in uh, that moderate zone um, of 64 to 76% of your heart rate max. Um, it's a good way if you can just look at your watch and kind of gauge where you are. Fitbit, Polar, Garmin, they all have different ways of defining those zones um, based on probably lots of data and uh, that they get from their watches and their apps. Um, I don't think it matters. How, which one you choose to use. I just say it's important to keep it consistent um, because as you get better, as you have adaptations, you're going to notice that your heart rate is lower at a certain intensity than it was before. Mm -hmm. um, that you have better endurance essentially. So if you keep your method consistent, you're going to see changes and those changes are going to tell us if we're improving or not. For example, on the lactate graph, if you were to be running at 10 miles an hour at your first lactate threshold um, before a training program. Then after a training program, you could run at 12 miles per hour at your lactate threshold. 
and that's very fast, but um, that means you, you improve heavily, right? Your cells can handle larger capacity. Um, so uh, keep your training zones consistent, whatever you choose. Um, but yeah, ACSM is a great one. I, I think that one is something you could use. Um, so if you need more access or more articles from them, let me know. I can send it to the group. Um, but this table is a good collection of different ways of defining it. And if someone was going to go out and try to test and kind of say, hey, where am I at? Is there a general way that someone watching here could perform some type of tests, use these heart rate zones and say, this is my current fitness level, or this is using this, this is where I should train at? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So um, you could, you could find your heart rate max if you wanted to. Um, you could also just do a, a incremental step test. And what I mean by that is every couple minutes you increase the intensity by a standard amount. So um, basically a, a really standard one is every minute increase intensity by one kilometer per hour. Um, you could also do um, about 0.5 to 0.6 um, miles per hour increase every minute as well. Um, and then if you have heart rate data uh, at every single minute here, you'll be able to see your heart rate associated with um, a certain intensity or pace. And then you could do that test, that same test a month from now after training and uh, basically see if your heart rate is lower um, or not. And you can see improvement. Um, again, you can't, you don't, you don't just want to jump into that test because it is a workout in itself. Um, you want to have a little bit of a base and then incorporating some intensity into your program before doing a test is beneficial. Oftentimes the mistake people make is do a really intense exercise test, do a max. It's a, it's a maximal bout of effort. It's a maximal bout. Um, and you could potentially get injured or overwork yourself. So, um, I recommend doing a good base training before you, uh, do a test like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I guess the other way to look at F it, rate of perceived exertion, if this is what's showing us here. So like you mentioned a second ago, heart rate might vary, depend on hydration, how well you slept, but it seems like almost rate of perceived exertion takes into consideration more so how you are in that moment. If I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's always relative because um, it's perceptual, um, which is great. And perception is such a valuable tool. Um, our brains are incredibly powerful at knowing how we feel. Um, so I think it's, it's probably one of the best in my, in my opinion, I think it's really easy to use. Um, and it's, if you did have a horrible sleep, you're probably going to perceive a harder, um, uh, higher rating, um, which will tell you, you know, maybe you need to not run as fast essentially. Um, if I, if you notice your an easy run is a lot harder that day for you. Um, I mean, that's a sign that you need to slow down. Um, so these scales are really simple to use. And if you get good at associating a number with a descriptor, um, it can be really valuable for your coach and for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the Borg scale is a very traditional way of looking at uh, perception. Um, the ratings are associated with or correlated with heart rate. So a uh, rating of six is no exertion at all. That's resting. It would be correlated with a heart rate of 60. Um, and then basically you just multiply each number by 10 um, to get the associated heart rate. Um, that was the original intention was they found that this scale, typically people report um, these ratings in a linear fashion, the same way uh, pace would increase linearly. So they're correlated. Um, I like personally the CR 10 scale, which is a modified version of that. We all know a, a rating zero through 10. We've been asked our whole life from, you know, at the doctor, how are you feeling on a scale from zero to 10? Um, so I think we have a better idea of that scale. So the Borg is something new. You'd have to probably train with it for a little bit. The CR 10 is something that, um, is very natural to use, I believe. Um, and it's very easy to break up as you can see here, rating zero through three is kind of a more easier run intensity. Um, and then you get, uh, basically rating four through six is kind of more of that tempo range. Um, probably what you'd feel during like a half marathon or marathon pace. Um, and then you have rating seven through 10, which is, would indicate a harder, harder bout of exercise. Um, if you go back to that lactate graph, it'd be probably associated with that, uh, zone three, um, intensity. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, perception is a really important, 
um, scale that you can use to gauge intensity. Um, yeah. So as you describe these and talk about different zones and different intensities, how often, where are most of your runners? If we talk about a uh, 40 to 60 year old recreational runner, typically does half marathons, full marathons. Mm -hmm. Are there certain ranges where you're spending most of your time or does it, is it span all through each of these? Yeah. So what's interesting is um, in a lot of training plans you look at, that coaches give elite athletes, you see about 80% of their training in like a zone one area. So a very easy, um, light run. Um, if you look at the CR 10 scale, it'll probably be from zero to four or zero to three. Um, so it'd be very easy, um, running. Um, then you see about 20% of that, uh, a weekly mileage in about uh, a higher intensity. So about from seven to 10. Um, a lot of these people are doing faster stuff like 10 Ks, five Ks, three Ks. So they, they're going to spend a lot of time at that sort of pace or intensity. Um, but you see also a lot of marathoners stay in kind of like that four and five somewhat hard zone. Um, cause they have to do long runs at a somewhat hard pace. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is specific to their event. Um, uh, but you do see what's interesting is about 80% of these uh, weekly intensities in the easy, and then 20% is um, more in that harder zone. Um, and that's, there's kind of a debate is like, should you purposely design a program that's 80% easy, 20% hard? Um, or does it come just kind of naturally? Um, I think it comes more naturally. I think you should probably do um, after a good base of easy training, uh, one to three sessions a week, one to two sessions a week of a harder bout. Um, and if you do that, you're going to keep those harder bouts a little bit shorter duration. It typically comes out to about 20% um, naturally, anywhere from 10 to 30%. So um, I think it comes more naturally if you only do one to two sessions and um, you should not be, if you're doing a harder session, you shouldn't do it at, for a long, long period of time. Um, you're going to get it. It's going to be a heavy low workload. So you need to shorten those durations up. Yeah. Well, that, that's good to yeah. hear. And so as we start to wrap up here, I just want to thank you for your time today. This has been great information. What are some of the key things you think people should uh, take away with them following this presentation today? Yeah. And I know it sounds elementary, but um, it's important to do both slow and fast runs. So um, you don't want to just do one or the other. You need to incorporate a plan that can um, get you to the point where you can run faster. So um, slowly increase intensity throughout the plan um, so that you can uh, peak at a certain time point, maybe for a race or something like that. But during that plan, incorporating both slow and faster runs um, is super important. Um, you also need to strategically incorporate intensity in plan. So you can't just throw it in there. Like I said, you want if you have a race, a goal race, you need to build up uh, a certain... Um, during a certain, in a certain timeline, essentially, or a certain, in a certain order. Um, secondly, define your method of deriving training zones and keep it consistent. So if you stick with heart rate, stick with heart rate. Don't, uh, don't change it up. Um, if you're using the ACSM version of heart rate, use the ACSM version of heart rate um, throughout your training plan, um, or at least throughout your training block. Um, and so you can switch it off after your training blocks. But Keep your method of deriving training zones consistent. Um, lastly, heart rate, RP, and ventilation are all easy ways to gauge intensity. We didn't talk about ventilation necessarily today, and maybe that's for another day, but um, how hard you're breathing can be a great indicator of how fast you're, you're running. Um, so, yeah. And so a couple questions here. Um, mm -hmm. And anyone else, if you have any questions as you guys sit on there right now, as we begin to wrap up, I'm going to take a couple minutes, answer some that were placed as you were put in as you registered for it, but if anyone has any other questions, feel free to add that to the chat box right now. We'll make sure to ask Spencer as we wrap up. So um, how to run slower was a question. Uh, and this and this actually is a, a client of mine who I consistently see like for some of the easy runs, yeah. always pushing it a little too fast, running in some faster ranges. Mm -hmm. Are any recommendations on running slower? Because I tend to hear from people that it gets uncomfortable, it doesn't feel as natural. So any recommendations that you give to your running clients? Yeah, so um, let's say we're using a the modified fork scale. You just want to adjust your pace to match 
um, how you're, how you perceive your effort. So, um, if you're running out there and it feels, um, hard for some reason, even though you're running slow already, you slow it down a bit. Um, if I'm supposed to be at a three that day out of 10, then I need to perceive a three out of 10, um, with my pace. So, um, really relying on, um, some sort of marker of intensity. It could be heart rate. It could be, um, RPE, your rate perceived exertion. Um, and it could even be lactate if you have access to that. Um, there's different ways of measuring intensity, how to slow down, just, just relax and, um, try to enjoy it, try to find, um, something to occupy your mind. Cause I know it can get boring and I get impatient too. And slow runs. I'm like, what, what am I doing? This is, this is super easy. Yeah. Right? It's supposed to feel easy. So allow yourself just to relax and, and try to enjoy the time. Yeah, I love it. And so if someone's trying to increase their speed, increase their pace, yeah. um, what recommendations do you give to a runner? Uh, I tend to see people, they want to run faster. So they automatically increase the pace on all of their runs. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain way you go about just the person that says, Hey, I want to become a faster runner. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I start building them up with mileage first. So increasing the volume of slow running to begin with, and you incorporate short bouts of intensity within that program. So it could be like strides. If you're heard of strides, these are like 10 to 20 seconds of, higher intense running and you do about five sets of those four or five sets of those. Um, and then you slowly incorporate smaller intervals, um, into the program. So, um, maybe one session a week, and then, um, maybe you, then you start with a faster workout once a week. Um, so you slowly build up, um, volume first, and then you can uh, increase intensity later on, as long as that total volume um, decreases a little bit. So if you want to become a faster runner, you need to make sure to, um, prep your body for it, essentially, um, give it a little stimulus here and there of, of high intense work. And then, um, give your time, give yourself time to recover when you do do the first big workout. Um, just make sure not to do a moderately hard effort on all your easy runs because, um, it takes time to recover from those moderately hard bouts and they catch up to you. So, um, run easy and run hard and take time to recover. That's, that's all, it's all it's about. Sounds pretty simple. Yep. <laughs> and so in terms of uh, pacing, how to, how to maintain a consistent pace, whether you recommend if anything you recommend, like using the Garmin as a tool to set paces. Uh, I know Mike and Diana asked how to do a better job controlling my pace and then mm -hmm. how to keep a consistent pace, which to me, seemed like two of the very similar things here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of keeping a consistent pace, um, it depends what you're doing. Um, on a recovery run, it like a easy run, maintaining a, a consistent pace, it won't necessarily matter. So don't feel bad if you slow down, um, or your, your pace is very variable. Um, that's okay. Um, as long as it's not, you know, a harder effort, you want to keep that slow. So, mm -hmm. um, but on a, like a, a more of a tempo run, a moderately hard uh, bout of exercise where you're trying to run a little bit faster for a little longer, um, how to keep it consistent. Yeah. I would rely on a watch and, um, yeah, take a look at, take a look at your pace every once in a while. Um, it just takes practice and it takes time. Um, and if you find that you're failing on these workouts, you're not able to maintain the, the pace for the prescribed workout um, the workout probably needs to change a little bit, um, maybe shorter bouts of that pace where you can maintain it. And then a little rest period and then shorter bouts of that pace again, um, and build up. So you, you can eventually maintain your pace. So if you're not keeping a pace consistent, that's okay. You just need to adjust the workout, um, so that you can complete it and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the other question? If, sorry. Uh, yeah. The, how to keep a consistent pace, how to do a better job controlling my pace. And I know specifically in this situation, someone that typically even for more, even group runs, like the, you'd think would be more easy conversational starting fast. And then from there kind of starting to fade away towards the end. So mm -hmm. is there any, I guess, any strategy as far as starting your run to finish strong with whatever the goal is or. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's tough. Um, 
because it's okay to slow down if you need to. Um, I would say start the run with a goal in mind. So if your goal that day is to run an easy run, tell yourself, Hey, I'm going to keep this pace at a three out of 10 level. And if you can't maintain that pace, just allow yourself to slow down. Um, that's okay. Um, so it's really about coming in with a goal and then being okay if that changes. So, um, I'm not sure there's a way to control your pace. And it's not, it's not a bad thing to be able to not control your pace. Okay. Um, I think that's the misconception. It's okay if your pace changes and something bad happens or uh, something changes. It's not bad. It, if anything, it can be a good thing. Um, it could indicate that you need to slow down. Um, or if you find that you're going too fast, um, uh, maybe that's okay for that day. Maybe you want to make it into a faster run. You can't shouldn't feel bad about it as long as you take the time to recover. Right, right, right. And so uh, last question here, uh, Diana asks, what should I do to improve my cadence? So any thoughts on cadence? We haven't talked about that at all here in this, but I'm yeah. curious on your take on, on cadence. And if mm -hmm. someone wants to improve it, is there a strategy that you recommend? Um, so definitely I'm not the expert on, on cadence here. Um, definitely more of biomechanics question. Um, I do think I, I think it's cadence is something your body's going to naturally set um, and optimize to um, basically reduce the amount of work that you're doing or um, keep it the most efficient level. Um, naturally, you're going to become more efficient over a long period of time. But let's say you have some sort of repetitive injury. Um, it could potentially cadence, adjusting your cadence could be beneficial um, to preventing that repetitive injury in the future. So reducing some of the forces happening in your body, um, could be really helpful in terms of strategies to do that. I think Garrett would probably be a better person to ask about that. If you have, um, he's a lot more trained and knowledgeable on that subject. Um, so I would definitely turn to someone like, like Garrett to, uh, to help out on that, in that regard. <laughs> Yeah, and definitely, definitely happy to talk about that, Diane, if you have any, any questions <laughs> there we want to dig into. But I just want to thank you for your time. I know we're a little bit longer than uh, anticipated, as always, because the information is so great. But if people want to get in contact with you, uh, questions, interested in a plan, you're you know, in Indiana, but sounds like some of the plans that you create can be for people, regardless of location as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we offer remote training, coaching. Um, and, uh, it can be as involved as you want it to be. Um, it can just be a simple training plan that you can follow and I can check in, um, or it can be more of a hey, daily check-in, um, and a customized plan. So, um, if you are looking for, um, a starting point or for, um, trying to, you know, achieve a personal best, um, I might have some strategies or advice, um, that could help you out. So please reach out, even if you just want to talk and, about how your training can improve, um, or maybe diagnose something that's going wrong with your training that we can uh, look at and, and change. So, um, if I can give any advice, um, that would be great. So please reach out to my Instagram handle, Miller underscore endurance. Um, and I'm also happy to provide, um, an email through, uh, after this presentation as well. If awesome. necessary. That sounds great. Well, we just want to thank you for your time and, and educating us on this topic today. Thanks everyone for, for joining the fireside chat. I hope you guys learned a lot. I'm, I'm going to send this out tomorrow at 11 AM. So make sure you go back and, and look at those key areas to make sure you're applying some of the stuff in your own training, but Spencer, thanks again. And I hope you have a great week. Thanks so much, Garrett. Thanks for having right. me on. Thank you. Thanks everyone.